Welcome to The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Listen to Joe tackle the really tough moral issues, current events, and politics from a Catholic perspective. Now here's Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Hello again, Sixpack Warriors. Welcome back to The Cantankerous Catholic, episode 189. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me, according to the regulation and uniform code of military justice. So help me God. Next week, we begin with Bishop Strickland's new segment on the Cantankerous Catholic. This week, I'm going to tell you how it came into being, how it's evolved since its inception, what you can expect, and how to submit questions for His Excellency. I try never to do this, but the Biden economy has this apostolate against the ropes. Virtually everything used to keep this apostolate in business is crushing me. Up to now, when the apostolate hasn't generated enough revenue to cover expenses, I paid for it out of pocket. That's no longer an option because our personal income is only about $2,000 per month and we're being crushed. I realize that this economy is hurting you too, but most of you have more disposable income than we do. I need your help because we're having to choose which essentials we can afford on a month-by-month basis. There are two ways you can help. In the show notes of each episode at cantankerouscatholic.com, there are a list of links under headings Earn Money Online, Courses and Tools, Health and Wellness, Trading and Investing, Podcasting, and Miscellaneous. These links are to products and services that may interest you, and I get a commission if you purchase them. As always, I won't recommend anything I believe is shady, and to the best of my knowledge, you can trust these links. The other way you can help is by clicking on the link that says help keep the Joe Sixpack the Every Catholic Guy Apostolate alive. You can make a one-time gift, but you'll also have the option of making yours a monthly gift. 
please make it a monthly gift if you can. Food shortages are already becoming apparent, and rolling blackouts are coming soon. We're elderly and ill. We need help, and I thank you in advance for your generosity. Before we begin, I want to thank those of you who have given gifts to this apostolate. I guess things are as tough for you as they are for me. While a lot of gifts have come in, they're smaller than usual and fewer in number. So I'll carry on this apostolate as long as the money lasts. I have to face the possibility that Jesus is telling me that he's done with the Joe Sixpack, the Every Catholic Guy apostolate. Blessed be the holy will of God. I think most of you believe that this show was all I do. That couldn't be farther from the truth, though. This show is the flagship of the apostolate, but it's not nearly everything being done. I also write weekly bulletin inserts for Parish Sunday bulletins. I don't even charge new subscribers for the first three months just so they can try it out, then only charge $19.95 a month. Since I've never had the money to use for marketing, I've never had more than 20 subscribers. Now I only have 10. Out of the 1995 monthly subscription, this apostolate only sees a net profit of a little over $16. It's not much. In addition to the bulletin insert and directly related to it is the JoeSixpackAnswers.com website. I have to do the maintenance and security on it, and that isn't cheap. But access to the site and everything on it is absolutely free. That includes an email course in the faith that arrives every three days to your inbox. One thing that evolved from the JoeSixpackAnswers.com website is the free weekly webinar series I host called Sharing the Catholic Faith. We're on summer break now until September 11, but it costs the apostolate $108 a month whether we're having presentations or not. In other words, the summer break cost us $540, even though we weren't using it. And these webinars are in high demand, so I've got to keep it. Then there are the books I write and the swag sold on cantankerouscatholic.com. You see the prices I charge and think this apostolate is making a killing. Truth of the matter is, between books and the swag, I only earn about $3.75 per sale on average. Then there's also my writing. I have a weekly column in The Wander and one on Church Militant. I get paid nothing from The Wander and only $100 occasionally from Church Militant. But I don't do it for the money. I do it for the sake of your immortal souls. I'm not the least bit afraid of dying, but I'm terrified of what happens immediately afterward. The thing I fear most is being asked by Jesus is if I did enough of doing something during the brief time he gave me here. That's why I do what I do, to be doing something. I'll continue to play the gift plea commercials during August, but I think we've pretty much dried out that well. So I'll continue what I do as long as the money you've so generously given holds out. But because I'm homebound and the primary care for my wife who has dementia, God expects us to put our survival first. Jesus told us to love others as we love ourselves. A lot of people get that backward. They think we have to love others first, but that's not true. If you don't put your needs, your genuine needs first, then you can't be there to help anyone else. Finally, gifts to this apostolate aren't tax deductible. When I began looking into beginning this apostolate, both famed apologist Carl Keating and radio personality Terry Barber advised me against tax-exempt status. Obama was in the White House at the time, and things were bad for Orthodox Catholics who were in apostolate. Things were good under Trump, but now we've got Sleepy Joe. Things are bad again. As long as an apostolate is tax-exempt, the government can really mess with you. So I opted to form an LLC. The tyrants in government can't mess with me. But then the bad side is that few of you are willing to help because it's not tax deductible. As things stand right now, this apostolate has enough money to last until the end of November. At that point, and all things remaining equal, I won't have any choice but to go back to work. 
I plan to go back into online local marketing, where I know I can earn $250,000 a year. And that's the damnable misery of it. That sort of money would solve all of this apostolate's financial worries, but I don't have time to work the apostolate and earn a living too. Taking care of my bride and myself must, by human nature, be the priority. The only thing I ask of you at this point is that you keep all of this in mind when you pay your bills this month. Keep us somewhere between the power bill and the water bill. Now let's get to Bishop Strickland. This new segment he's going to have on the Cantankerous Catholic is called The Sacred Heart Wins. How this whole thing came about says a lot about his character and Christ-like manhood. A little over a year ago, I began talking very boldly about our Orthodox bishops being cowards. I was merciless to them as well they deserved. When confronted about why they wouldn't stand up for Catholic truth while their brother bishops in the USCCB were running a criminal empire, they gave typically cowardly answers. They were afraid of losing their dioceses or being persecuted by the likes of Cardinal Supich. In the meantime, the laity had to pay the price for that cowardice as Catholics began abandoning ship by the millions, literally millions. But then something began to happen late last year. One bishop began to boldly speak up. That bishop was Bishop Strickland of Tyler, Texas. Because of that, I invited Bishop Strickland to be on the show at the beginning of last June for Toxic Mail Month. After the way I'd talked about him on previous episodes, I was quite frankly surprised that he accepted my invitation. Well, he came back on the show, and I think it's the most exciting show I've ever done. His Excellency was dynamite. It's important to note that in that episode, I informed him that I'd previously called him a coward, just in case he'd never heard that. Several weeks later, I got an email from Bishop Strickland. He emailed me from an airport and attached his private cell phone number. He said he was in an airport awaiting a connecting flight. He asked that if I had time, would I give him a call? A bishop is the successor of the apostles, whether he's good or bad. So when he asks you to call him, you drop what you're doing and call. I was in the middle of something very important, but I dropped it and picked up the phone. He and I just chatted for a couple of minutes, but I could tell he had something to ask me. He finally brought it up. Bishop Strickland asked if I'd be willing to add a segment to the Cantankerous Catholic where he could answer questions of you six-pack warriors. No bishop, absolutely no bishop, has done that since Archbishop Fulton Sheen. I said it would be an honor, and my mind began churning immediately to think about the format. What really impressed me in this call is that His Excellency came to me to ask for this, despite that he knew I'd previously publicly called him a coward. That shows a heaping helping of character. In episode 178, His Excellency explained why he'd suddenly began to change from a cowardly bishop to one who was boldly doing what he was consecrated to do. Every public story has a more in-depth part to it, and after the recording had been turned off, he told me the rest. I won't divulge it here, but you can believe me when I tell you it was edifying. While I was contemplating the format for this segment, it still had to have a name. I even asked you six-pack warriors for help with that, but as it turned out, heaven had already chosen a name. SCOTUS overturned Roe vs. Wade on the solemnity of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. I was watching live coverage that day on Church Militant. They had a soundbite from Bishop Strickland. That's when it dawned on me that the segments simply had to be called the Sacred Heart Wins. I emailed His Excellency about it, and he was all on board with that. So I wrote the copy for an intro and had Rick Stender the show's voiceover artist, record it for me. In the meantime, questions for Bishop Strickland were pouring in from you six-pack warriors. When I saw the nature of some of those questions, I began to wonder if he'd want to cherry-pick some of them. In conscience, I couldn't have that and be true to God or you six-pack warriors. So I discussed it with the bishop. Thanks be to God, he agreed that all of you had a right to hear answers to your questions, regardless of what they are. 
We recorded all of the August questions and answers in early July. Based on my experience with the bishop, I decided that each segment would have him answer just one question. The goal was to have the segment run for about 10 minutes, and I really thought that his answer to each question would run that long. They didn't. We're not going to change the August segments a bit. That would require additional studio time for Bishop Strickland, and he's pretty doggone busy. But when we record the September questions and answers next week, I'll be asking him four questions for each segment instead of only one. I've got to tell you, though, you won't be disappointed by the August segments. They're great. The Sacred Heart Winds will replace Catholic News Notes. That just seemed the most logical segment to replace. In light of this new segment, I don't think you'll miss it a bit. We have a cache of questions now, but we need to keep that cache filled. So if you've got questions for Bishop Strickland, please send them to me at joe at cantankerouscatholic.com or send them through the contact form on cantankerouscatholic.com. Six-Pack Warriors, I don't know if you realize just how big this is. Bishop Strickland will be the first bishop since Archbishop Fulton Sheen actually addressing the concerns of the laity. Sheen died in 1979, so it's been over 40 years since a bishop has loved Jesus and the laity enough to put himself out there with the fullness of Catholic truth. Cash in on it and make up your mind right now to never miss an episode. Tell all your family and friends about it, and let's keep those fresh questions coming in. If Catholics have any hope of returning the country to God, our families to God, then we need to match and surpass the intensity of the Marxists. It's impossible to turn on the news and not see another victory from the anti-family woke crowd. You cannot create any meaningful change by sitting back and just consuming podcasts and signing online petitions. Church Militant's Call to Action Convention is the blueprint for taking back the church and the culture. We've assembled a team of panelists that have unseated politicians, exposed corrupt clergymen, and saved the unborn, not to mention converted people to the one true faith. And now we are asking you to get involved. What you put into this is what you we'll get out of it. So please sign up at cmresistance.com and we'll show you exactly how you can begin to change your local community to be God-fearing, pro-family, and true to our country's values of life, liberty, and the pursuit of true happiness. Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy, wants to make sure you're informed about all the Catholic news you need to know. Here's Joe Sixpack's top five Catholic news picks for this episode. Catholic news pick number five. Hats off to CNS News. Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton has sued the Department of Health and Human Services for intervening to promote abortions in the pro-life state. The Biden administration's response to the fall of Roe v. Wade is to attempt to use federal law to transform every emergency room in the country into a walk-in abortion clinic, the lawsuit states. Why, you must be delusional or something. You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic News Pick number 4. Hats off to the Daily Wire. A D.C. jury has convicted Donald Trump's former top advisor, Stephen Bannon, who pleaded not guilty of two counts of contempt of Congress. Bannon defied a subpoena to answer questions from the Democrat-led January 6th committee. I only have one disappointment, Bannon said Friday, and that is the gutless members of that show trial committee didn't have the guts to come down here and testify in open court. Despicable! You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic News Pick number three. Hats off to Breitbart. A lawsuit filed by the left-wing ACLU on behalf of two men who say they are women has reached a settlement that will force Georgia's Medicaid program to pay for sex change surgeries and other transgender treatments. The complaint stated that Georgia incorrectly characterized the health care needs of both women as cosmetic and experimental, the Hill reported. 
The ACLU says that the settlement means any Georgia resident will be able to use Medicaid to pay for transgender surgery in the future. You will rot in hell! You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic Catholic News News Pick number number two. Hats off to LifeSite News. Republican attorneys general on Thursday threatened legal action against Google if the big tech company censors pro-life pregnancy resource centers on its search engine. Suppressing pro-life and pro-mother voices at the urging of government officials would violate the most fundamental tenet of the American marketplace of ideas, stated the Virginia Attorney General and 16 other attorneys general in a letter to Google's CEO. We're watching you. You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic Catholic News Pick pick number one. one. Hats off to the Daily Signal. Public documents reveal that the Los Angeles Unified School District has been promoting transgender theory to K-12 students since 2021. The district recently held a panel of queer 7th graders at a conference that encouraged athletes to come out. The conference also gave out gender-affirming clothing and included instructions on how to refute religious objections to gender theory. Whose idea was this? You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Got a business or an apostolate? Why not consider advertising on the Cantankerous Catholic? I'll give you nine reasons why you should. One, 82.4% of podcast listeners spend more than seven hours per week listening to podcasts. Two, 54% of listeners are more likely to buy something advertised on a podcast because they like and trust the host. Three, podcasts are proven to get more ad results to highly refined targeted audience. The smaller audiences on podcasts buy more than the largest audiences on terrestrial radio or television. Four, our listeners' annual household income is $75,000 or higher. Five, 49% of Americans listen to podcasts monthly. Six, 55% of Americans listen to podcasts. Seven, three out of four listeners listen to learn new things, ideal for advertisers. Eight, 82.4% of podcast listeners spend more than seven hours per week listening to podcasts. Nine, advertising on the Cantankerous Catholic helps support a completely orthodox apostolate poised to help instigate a Catholic revival, and one's coming. Over 81% of our more than 70,000 listeners are right here in America. We're listened to in all 50 states and tens of thousands of cities and towns. Advertising on the Cantankerous Catholic costs far less than you might think. I'm not trying to make a living, but only keep this apostolate alive, and you'd be helping with that. So reach out to me today at joe at cantankerouscatholic.com, and let's talk about it. It's time for the Catholic Boot Camp with your drill sergeant, Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Learn the Catholic faith and how to defend it like you've never heard it before. This boot camp is tough, so there's no political correctness, no spirit of Vatican II, and no namby-pamby platitudes. Drill Sergeant Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy, will prepare you for spiritual war. Now here's Joe Sixpack. It's said that the rosary is the gospel story through the eyes of the Blessed Virgin Mary. This is especially true of the first set of mysteries, the joyful mysteries. Indeed, all five of them are taken from the gospel according to Luke, which is often called the gospel according to Mary. It's obvious that Luke, who wasn't present with Jesus during his public ministry but a later convert, had interviewed the Blessed Virgin Mary before he wrote his gospel. 
Mary traveled with her son during most of his public ministry, so she was present for most of the events Luke writes about. The first two chapters of Luke give us information not supplied by the other three evangelists because only Mary and Joseph were present for those events. I especially love the joyful mysteries because reading them in Luke's gospel shows us how pure and in tune Mary's heart was to the heart of her son. She shows us how worthy she is of our love and devotion. Before we take a look at those mysteries, let me hasten to point out one thing people seldom consider about Mary, but something the doctors and fathers of the church have recognized since the beginning of Christianity. Mary was immaculately conceived. That is, the doctrine which declares that the most blessed Virgin Mary, in the first instant of her conception, by a singular grace and privilege of Almighty God, in view of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the human race, was preserved exempt from all stain of original sin, is a doctrine revealed by God, and therefore must be believed firmly and constantly by all the faithful, according to Pope Pius IX. So by being immaculately conceived, Mary is the only mother in all of human history who was created by her own son. Think about this. If you could have created your own mother, wouldn't you have made her absolutely perfect? That's what Jesus did. We all saw our mothers as perfect when we were little children, but as we grew older, we began to see their flaws and imperfections. Jesus, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, never saw any imperfections in his mother because he created her perfect in her mother's womb. And it's Mary's perfection that causes us to have such a great love and devotion for her as the mother of God. The Annunciation is an amazing event. Have you ever read and meditated on it? Picture Mary when Gabriel came to visit her. The angel greeted her by a title, full of grace. After the greeting, Luke tells us in 129, she was greatly troubled at the saying and considered in her mind what sort of greeting this might be. Then the angel told her not to be afraid. Most people think he told her not to fear because of his appearance, but the implication in Scripture is that she was made afraid by the greeting. No one before had ever been given such a celestial greeting, and Mary was rightly puzzled by this. Mary knew and understood from the moment of her son's conception exactly who he was. So it's only reasonable to expect that when he grew older and St. Joseph had passed from this life to leave the two of them alone together, she'd have asked him about things she didn't fully understand surrounding his entry into the world in his human nature. I believe she asked Jesus about the greeting, and that's why she told Luke of her apprehension over Gabriel's greeting, giving us a hint of her special privilege of the Immaculate Conception. I do know it was certainly believed by the apostles from the earliest times, which is why Pius IX was able to define the Immaculate Conception as being revealed by God. Of the joyful mysteries, though, the thing I love most, and most of us think little about, is what Mary said in her Magnificat after Elizabeth responded to her greeting in the visitation in Luke 1, 46-55. She said, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel, for he remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his children forever. The immaculately conceived heart of Mary was filled with the Holy Spirit as she proclaimed the beauty of God's greatness in explaining to Elizabeth why the mother of my Lord had come to visit her. Elizabeth had just called Mary blessed, and Mary made the prophecy that all generations would call her blessed, something we do every time we pray the Hail Mary. 
The Blessed Virgin Mary clearly understood who she was and God's purpose for her. When we pray the rosary, it's more than simply reciting prayers. We're supposed to meditate on each mystery during the recitation. It's evident from Scripture that Mary herself meditated on these mysteries. Regarding the Nativity, Luke tells us that after the birth of our Lord, the shepherds came from the fields to worship the Christ child. Then he writes, But Mary kept all of these things, pondering them in her heart. Apparently, Mary also meditated on the events of the presentation at the temple because she was able to quote to Luke exactly what Simeon had said of her son. I suspect what she most considered were his final prophetic words of the old rabbi. Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Then there's the finding Jesus in the temple. Returning to Nazareth from the Passover in Jerusalem, Mary and Joseph had traveled three days before realizing Jesus wasn't with them a foreshadowing of the separation from him between his death and resurrection. They had assumed Jesus was with other families' children in the caravan, playing, as all children do. Upon realizing he was missing, imagine Mary's frantic fear and concern for her lost child. She had to wonder if successors of those who had sought his life had finally caught up with him. But when Mary and Joseph returned to Jerusalem, they were both relieved and amazed to find Jesus confounding and teaching the elders in the temple. When the relieved mother of God found him, she asked, Son, why have you treated us so? Jesus' reply was, How is it that you sought me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Again, his mother kept all these things in her heart, according to Luke, telling us she meditated on the events of her divine son throughout her life. From the moment Gabriel told Mary why he was visiting her, she was perfectly free to refuse the offer being made to become the mother of God, as is evinced by the fact that Gabriel waited for her fiat before departing. This means that Mary fully understood what she was doing when she consented to God's plan, and she willingly participated in our redemption through the death of her son. Mary's perfections, her willingness, her suffering for us makes her worthy of our devotion and love. If you're taking any prescription medication to control diabetes, or even pre-diabetes, new studies from Italy and New Zealand show that type 2 diabetes and pre-diabetes can be managed or possibly even reversed if you know how. While most medications can keep the symptoms of diabetes at bay, they don't actually treat the root cause of the problem. So before you resign yourself to being hooked on medication for life, you've got to see a video about Glucofort. The link is in my show notes. I've been taking Glucofort for two months and it's had a dramatic effect on my blood sugar number. My primary care physician is amazed. So do what I did. Watch the video, then order the package of all-natural glucofort that's right for you by clicking the glucofort link in my show notes. The Catholic Church is 2,000 years old. A lot of wisdom is gained over two millennia. Each week we'll share some of that wisdom with a Catholic quote. So here's this week's Catholic quote. This week's Catholic quote is from Archbishop Fulton Sheen. He said, Men do not want to believe their own times are wicked, partly because they have no standard outside of themselves by which to measure their times. If there is no fixed concept of justice, how shall men know when it is violated? I believe a really great way to teach the faith is through stories, parables, and anecdotes. So here's today's story. An old monk was dying. As was customary in monasteries, the dying priest's fellow religious came to his bedside to pray for him in his final agony. They heard him whispering the word, Book. One of the monks brought him his breviary and handed it to the dying monk. He shook his head slowly as if to say that this wasn't the book he wanted. 
Another brought him a Bible, thinking that this was surely the book he meant. But again he shook his head. Then they watched him fix his eyes with great love on the crucifix hanging on the opposite wall. The youngest of the brothers went to the crucifix, took it from the wall, and placed it in the hands of the dying priest. Tears filled his eyes as he pressed the cross to his heart, and with his last breath spoke these words, My book. In the crucifix, the good monk saw the image of the person of Jesus who loved him. You need to look often into this book of the crucifix, as the good monk must have done during his lifetime. You'll find three chapters in the book. Chapter 1, Who? Who it is who suffers. Chapter 2, What? What does he suffer? Chapter 3, Why? Why does he suffer? Study these chapters carefully, and you'll hate sin as the greatest evil in the world. You'll love Jesus as your greatest friend. This has been The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Thanks for subscribing, and be sure to visit cantankerouscatholic.com to get your free copy of Joe's popular book, The Best of What We Believe, Why We Believe It.